Hey everyone, I'm Patrick Jones, and welcome to episode 63 of That Gives Me Anxiety. Ugh. <laughs> I'm sorry for forcing that rhyme. I had a great weekend. One of my best friends and one of his sons were visiting us, and th he's three years old, and so just hilarious what they say at that age, and just so great to spend time with him. Both of them, of course. You know, making sure he gets a waffle, right? Things like that. You want to be associated with fun, right? Whenever someone's kids come by, showing them Franklin, Jamie and my tortoise. It's always a hit with kids. Always a hit. <laughs> Especially if you can get Franklin to eat, which he doesn't eat on command, right? It's not like having a dog, which we, uh, of course, we do have Ollie. But Frank's very set in, in what he wants to do. <laughs> so even if you put a piece of food, like some romaine or a strawberry or a grape or something like that, that he would like to eat typically if he's not ready he's not gonna do it he's not gonna put on a show for you <laughs> speaking of children i'm i'm home by myself all this week jamie's traveling for work a bunch of different spots around the country and it's hilarious how quickly i revert back to the neanderthal that i <laughs> that i am deep down you know when jamie's here i'm trying to put in every effort i can to make our lives as smooth and nice as possible you know i like cooking a lot it's a way of expressing my love but when she's not here i don't know scrambled eggs for dinner <laughs> maybe i'll go get a pizza and eat it over a few days yeah who am i kidding and eat it immediately i just start wearing old t-shirts like i am right now just a lot of things go out the window it just makes me think if i was still single at this point I, i'd be dead right <laughs> <laughs> Not to get too dark on you here, but <laughs> I wasn't making the healthiest choices when I was by myself. Not that being in a relationship is the only reason to live. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, this I meant this to just be funny. It's taken a dark turn. But one good thing that's not dark is with Jamie out, it means the sports that I like to watch go on the big TV. <laughs> you know, it's like Jamie's not really into sports, and so if I want to watch something, you know, I'm in. I'm on one of the backup TVs. I'm on my phone, right? But now they're they're playing in the main theater. Let's go Rangers! <laughs> so yeah, I've got a great episode lined up for you uh, today. We're going to be talking about anxiety associated with work communication, right? Through emails, uh, maybe official writing that you have to do. Slack and Teams. And help me out, I have expert Aaron Lebax, who's a, as I said, a work communication expert, and my friend Stacy Bailey, who's a performer at Theater 99, Improv Theater here in Charleston, and is also the chief operating officer of a digital advertising agency. So yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, especially in, in the remote environment that we're in, and I hate, I'm using that cliche, the remote environment. We're in this remote environment. I mean, we are, and I don't know what else to call it, but it just feels overused, right? Regardless, you, you have to get the you have to get your communications uh, correct, right? People can misunderstand things or misinterpret them, and there's different cultural differences across the country, the world, the state, the town you're in, right? People just interpret things differently, so you have to be mindful of that. So yeah, we we discuss how to how to get work communication done correctly. But before we get to the interviews, I just want to remind you, if if you're liking the show, please remember to rate and review it on whatever platform you're listening to it on. You can check the show out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, or YouTube. YouTube is where you can see the old t-shirt I'm wearing because Jamie's out traveling the country. If you're liking the show and you want to support it, you can make a donation through the Buy Me a Coffee link in the description. And as always, my partnership with Pure Spectrum, who offer the promo code ANXIETYPOD, which gives you 15% off. I use more than five products of theirs a day. <laughs> it just helps with the day-to-day -day anxiety and, and depression and managing symptoms. Just helping me calm. That's what it's all about. Just calming. Between the solves, salves, the gummies, there's like this bath bomb powder, moisturizers, you name it. They've got it and, and it's awesome stuff. So yeah. Promo code ANXIETYPOD for 15% off. Well, all right, I think it's time to start talking about work communication. 
As always, thank you so much for listening and enjoy. Joining me now on the podcast, I have my friend Stacy Bailey, who's a, an improviser and is also the CEO and is also the COO of Reason One, which is a digital agency. Stacy, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Pat. I was just saying to Stacy, first friend from the Charleston area to come on. I mean, this is this is a big deal. I feel very honored. Yeah, it's it's proving to the world that I'm I'm growing in my new home and actually we making have friends. friends. Yes, we have local friends. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you're the perfect person to talk about uh, work communication. I mean, because you are an improviser and also have a professional job. I, I'm curious though. Before we dig into that. I want to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience and, and talk a little bit about who you are and, and and what you do. Sure. Thank you. Well, I have been at Reason One, which is a digital agency based in the US and Canada for the last almost 12 years, which is like ancient and agency life. Mm -hmm. Had a lot of experience and growth there from project management into operations. And I attribute a lot of my success to improvising and like the communication styles that you learn through improv with, you know, empathy and active listening and all of these qualities that I think really help in my work every day. And I have become sort of the, I don't know, improv advocate at work where everyone's mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, no, seriously, these are qualities that we should all have and practice. And it gives you a lot of reps uh, so that you can, you know, be great with each of your teammates and with clients and all these sorts of things. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm I'm the same person at work too. And and we could get into like a, a, a loop here of being like, is it not improv great? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's good for for going to parties where you don't know people, job interviews, on and on and on, right? The the skills and ex exactly what you're saying, like the empathy aspect is is huge. It, it just like it makes so much more sense once you actually start thinking about how using empathy in your communication can be helpful. Absolutely. Um, well, one one of the things I wanted to bring up sort of off the bat was I, I was for the for the listeners, I was emailing the wrong Stacy Bailey. <laughs> and so I followed up with Stacy wondering if if she had listened to the clips. And you came back to me saying that you are very good at responding to people. And that's extraordinarily rare. So, I mean, normally, you know, between texts with friends, right? Like it, I'll respond in a couple of days or emails at work, right? If it's not important. So I'm curious, when did that start for you? And, and was it easy to get going? Or is that just like a superpower of yours? I think it's because I'm an only child and mm. I want friends all of the time to be, <laughs> you know, nearby. It's an expectation that I've developed that if someone is interested in whatever is happening at work or personal life, like that they'll respond, you know, within mm -hmm. a reasonable amount of time. So yeah, when you were like, did you get this? I was like, oh my gosh, it, I am not a ghoster. So if I didn't respond, just assume I didn't get it and not that mm -hmm. I am missing you. Because, because I also think that there's a lot of respect that comes from you know, responses, even if the response is like, I have received this and I will have to process this information later. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, in this digital age, leaving people hanging when they know that you've likely gotten it quickly. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, it's just like the, the leaves people feeling uncomfortable. And so I really, I think from out of a place of respect, want people to know that I've, I've received and will respond promptly and whatever that means in the context of my current circumstances, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're so right. Just just knowing that someone has something is like great. It's like it it it's, it takes it out of their brain and and you can set it aside and and especially when you communicate that effectively, I I you would then trust that person, right? Like right. they understand what I'm experiencing. Look at all this empathy you have. That's great. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, with whatever, whether it's in text messages or in Slack, you know, where there's the reactions, it's like, I, I ask my team often, like, I need you to react to as a, as a record of receipt of this mm -hmm. method, right? Because when you're just like blasting information out, whether it's email, text, phone, whatever, and you don't know whether they got it or not, it leaves a lot of anxiety and then mm -hmm. it puts the burden on back on you to like follow up or whatever, right? Versus 
them saying I, I have received this ball, which actually now that I'm going to be that improv person at work is sort of like the improv game, right? Where it's like, <laughs> yeah. I have the ball. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to worry right now because I've got it. And then I will mm -hmm. pass it back to you. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's part of being a good teammate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, as you know, you're in leadership, I mean, setting the tone in that for the entire organization I mean, I've worked at companies where that's not the case and and you have to like hunt down leadership to to get an answer and that that drains on whatever you're trying to get done, right? So that's yeah, I I really Absolutely. love and respect that 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 you do that. Yeah, I definitely lean pretty hard into trying to lead by example. Mm -hmm. uh, cuz I don't think it's fair to have expectations of others that I don't hold of myself and I think that the it's it's very easy for people to be like, well, I'm not going to do that if you don't do that. Right. And, mm -hmm. and admittedly, I have worked with people who are like that. And then, and that's the feedback from the team is like, well, but they don't do that. <laughs> well, okay. What so, are we six? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going to be a little bit of a do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, but that's how people feel like their time is being respected is if you, mm -hmm. you know, follow the same rules. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for the listeners, I, I think it's important to mention that I also interviewed work communication expert, Aaron Lobax, and I think it's a good time to go to the first clip. Fantastic. Joining me now on the podcast to talk about work communications, I have Aaron Lobax, who's a, an international educator and author. Aaron, thank you so much for your time. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Of course. Yeah. You know, it's so funny to think about work communications causing so much anxiety, but yes. it's a it's a very real thing. I, I feel like in my day job, I am a writer. I, I create content and, and I feel anxious every day about everything I submit, every email. Right. It, it's just it's a very real thing. And, and it's not something that's often discussed. Right. Right. I know. I think it's the kind of thing that we keep hidden. I think we grow up sort of feeling like, well, I should be good at this. And then we get into the workplace and it often isn't spoken about. So we're all just walking around with simultaneous matching secrets that we're all secretly nervous about the communication that we're sending to one another. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, let's, let's start by having you introduce yourself a little bit to, to everybody. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I've been teaching writing since the late 90s. It's been kind of a while mostly in the college and university environment, which was fun because my timing was such that I had 20 years right when the millennials were going through college. So I got to hang out with a generation other than my own and, and kind of get schooled in different cultural ways. After 20 years, I thought, hey, I want to teach in other places to mix it up. So I now teach in businesses and nonprofits, helping people feel confident about their writing and helping teams write to one another in a way that's efficient actionable, but also includes what I call writing EQ, emotional intelligence that we can bring to our writing since we're actually using it to connect to people as well as inform them. So I offer workshops and teach that way through different venues to help people get more confident and clear, whether they're writing as a leader or as a new person who just got out of college and you're kind of like, oh shoot, this is not the same writing we did before. That's what I'm all about is helping people kind of realize, oh, I can control my writing. I can own my writing. It doesn't have to feel out of control. And there are strategies for doing that. Oh, man, that's so interesting. Yeah, it's also, you know, in this half remote environment, your, your written words are, are even more important than they were, right? As opposed to like, you know, you may bump into the person later in the office and now you're using it to get to know people, right? It's there's so much to, to dig into, right? Like the overuse of the exclamation point to seem yes. as like, I'm light, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, you're totally right. I mean, we write to people we'll never meet now, which means we might have a relationship that exists only through our emails or our DMs or texts or whatever it is. I mean, you and I, Patrick, I think are an example. This is our first time mm -hmm. talking in a way that was not through writing. Mm -hmm. and, and yet when we got to the podcast, you know, I felt like we already had some trust because we'd been writing back and forth in, in a good way. Um, mm -hmm. So we were able to start a relationship before getting to know each other. But that's really important today because so many times our entire idea of a person exists through the writing we've received through, from them. 
Well, I, I'm I'm so happy to hear that uh, my writing w- was was perceived well to the expert. That makes me feel good. It makes me feel because again, you know, even as you started talking about that, I was like, oh gosh, did I do? Right. Did I break one of the the cardinal rules that you're about to walk us through? Uh, but yeah, yeah that makes me feel good. People so get nervous. Yeah, go ahead. let's talk about some things that, you know, there's two different things that I, that I see here and, and maybe, maybe they're one, I'll, I'll let you explain. It's writing that's like copywriting, right? And then there's write or like stories or whatever it is. And then there's like the email writing, the Slack and Teams writing uh, more, you know, back and forth correspondence. Uh, do you approach those differently when working with a business? I sure do. That's a great question. Because, and it's exactly what I think we all want to talk about to get more confident about writing is that we we never write the same way in two different situations, mm-hmm. which relates to the idea that I find helpful for writing anxiety, which is that there is not one correct way to write. Mm-hmm. There's not some kind of perfect way to write that we're all supposed to imitate. It's always That's nice to know, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, we've I think we grow up thinking that there is like, oops, I did this wrong on my paper. So now I'm the wrong one. Um, (laughs) But it's just right. It's not logical to think that when we really dig into it, because I emailed you. And then that same day I texted my partner and my friends. And that same day I emailed a colleague. Mm -hmm. Of course, I wrote differently in all of those situations. So yeah, that's one of the most empowering realizations, I think, is that we can make our writing decisions based on what our goal is and who's going to read it. So that includes where is this writing occurring? If I'm on Slack or Teams, my goal is maybe to give a quick update or to agree or disagree on an idea. But while preserving the relationship, those goals can help us realize, oh, okay, so I want to write in this manner right now because I have a particular goal. And then of course, if it's an email or if we're doing marketing copy or something like that, we have completely different goals, which will mm-hmm. then guide us to different choices. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. So ask it from my own experience, right? Uh, it, you talked about potentially you're going to have these relationships with people at work that you may never meet, right? And so one of my strategies is to try to add a little color, right? To add something from my day, to add a GIF, something in, in that form. Is that something that you encourage people to add a little color when when you're connecting with someone who's going to be working on a project with you? In general, yes. Um, I'll say a couple things on that. I think number one, yes, we it is okay to sound like a human being when you write. And a lot of us <laughs> don't know that because when we are looking at other writing, it often sounds bureaucratic. When we read official things on official websites, we might think, oh, I'm supposed to sound generic and like a bureaucrat, but no, it's good to sound like a human being. After all, like we've been saying, this is how we forge our relationships. So showing something of who you are is a smart idea. That said, I would always want to come back to the two questions that guide any writing decision. Same one we mentioned earlier, what's my goal and who is my reader? And there might be cases where that particular reader wouldn't respond well to something like that. Or if one's goal is very much along the lines of something official and serious, we would adjust our use of emoji and gifts and everything. But I think when we're trying to build a relationship, try to start sneaking in, you know, things to show who you are as you go and as you get to know your reader and building that trust together. That's great. Uh, yeah, I always felt, you know, I always appreciate that when I get that from somebody, it helps humanize yeah. someone, particularly on Slack and Teams, where it's just a picture, right? It's it's yeah. it's like you're talking to a, a computer unless they begin to express themselves or let let you in. I agree. It can make the writing kind of come alive. And I often suggest to people that, of course, when you speak to somebody and you're looking at them and you're you're adjusting the way you speak all the time based on their feedback, right? Mm-hmm. But we don't necessarily get that in writing. But when I write to someone, I try to imagine that I'm speaking to them and what is their face going to look like when I write certain things. Um, And so I think that further speaks to your idea that if you start showing who you are, people will know how to communicate with you and you'll kind of come alive off the page and it'll be clear, oh, there's a human there. This is not just a procedural message to nobody. (laughs) One of the things that we 
I, I spoke about with Aaron and I'm curious to get your take on is I try to add like gifts or, or a little bit of like color to messages, especially on like Teams or Slack. Is that something you do as well? Oh, all of the time. Yeah. Everything is like glittered in emojis and gifts because written communication can be so sterile mm -hmm. that it is a really good way to add what we like to call sugar to the <laughs> communication, right? Like there are certain things that just need a little bit of sugar to mm -hmm. sort of express what your emotional intent is behind whatever you're saying so that people interpret it the way that you're hopefully intending. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because things can be misinterpreted, right? Like so often people could be like, oh, I don't like the tone of the sentence I just read. Man, Slack tone is just so challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, but we we had a content strategist for a while who did a lot of ongoing education around plain language mm -hmm. and the way that you can best communicate through plain language. But one of the things she learned a lot about is like that there's ways to style your written language so that your intent comes across better, right? So it's it's things like emojis and GIFs, but it's also like silly ways of spelling things, you know, that, mm. that you know, adding Zs and like these ways that are like almost written dialects to, okay. to, sh to come across the way that you're, you're being cheeky or, you know, whatever, mm. right? So we, we definitely do a lot of that. And I love the randomized Giphy generator in Slack. It's like, my yeah, favorite. it's Slack. My company recently switched to teams and mm -hmm. the Giphy generator is just not there. And I, not good. I, I feel lost <laughs> having to copy right? and paste from Giphy itself is crazy. That's great. <laughs> That's way too many clicks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it's similar adding gifts and, and, and color to communication. I feel like it, it can be considered similar to, I and I'm guilty of this, and I hate that I'm confessing this, but the exclamation points and, and you know, the almost like apologizing when you're asking for something to be done. Uh, is that something that you run into? Especially, you know, even Aaron and I were talking about how like women in business definitely feel as though that that's almost expected of them. Yeah. So I don't necessarily have a lot of uh, attention or focus on it being like the, the quintessential question mark at the end of a statement or, you know, mm -hmm. adding lots of additional punctuation, but I, I do try to keep my written communications fairly tight in terms of not adding a lot of extra fluff in that you know, being guilty as a woman, like of just adding, it's okay if you don't like, but, yeah. you know, or how, you know, whatever. <laughs> but I do think that the adding color helps sort of humanize the whoever might be behind the keyboard a little bit. And I really think it's interesting with this whole new chat GBT thing, what's going to happen there with communications and stuff. If anything, like those personal elements are going to prove that you're not a robot. <laughs> <laughs> right I, I bought, you know but i but i think they also anything that can make people laugh and smile at mm -hmm. work is like a real got a really high value right um, absolutely i mean leaning into what you were just talking about there i mean my job is based in new jersey i live in the charleston area uh, my company is across the world and 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 yours is in canada and the united there are people that I've never met in person and you've never met in person Most that you team, have yeah. to communicate with. I mean, it, it's so important to to get the digital communication correctly. So is that something that you guys like actively talk about or is that yeah. you just like <laughs> fingers crossed? Yeah. So, you know, we do have certain, I hesitate to say policies, but we do have certain like communication policies and standards documents to try and set expectations about what, you know, what channels are for what kind of mm. communication and information and that sort of thing. And it's certainly something that we play with and explore on a cultural level. Like for example, on Wednesdays, we do midweek magic where we ask a silly prompt in our general channel and encourage people to, to respond. So that could be anything like, you know, what's the best gift that describes your weekend or, mm. you know, what's the, what are the top 10 emojis in your most commonly used or whatever. So right, like there are these like digital artifacts, if you will, that help people express or like contribute in a meaningful way. And it's mm -hmm. fun to see what people 
host or are willing to kind of share about. So, <laughs> I so, just had to laugh at willing to share about, right? There's always yeah. the person that's like oversharing a little bit too much. Yes, we do have some overshare. We had a, we've got fun ones like, what's the, you know, picture of a celebrity or whatever. And you've got most people post one. And then you've got the couple of people who's like, here are the 18 celebrities I've met. And, you know, it's like, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we see you. We hear you. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. So, uh, I love Planet Hollywood too, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just like the wax figures. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> here's my album of my wax figure that's great i i think those things go a long way uh similarly we do chats that go on for a while and like we build brackets for favorite fast food places or, or best american bands and and people yes. debate you know one or the other and it only seldomly gets heated but <laughs> yes yeah i find the ones that get the most heated are the like the the negative like which which thing is worse like mm. which one do you, you know which one's worse like ketchup or mustard whatever and then people are like ketchup is the worst but yeah like, if, if you frame this thing it's just amazing what people will get I, um, I don't understand how you can like have that level of outbursts like ready to go about like such menial things oh it's always food related we had we yeah. had one team member who i love who there were several years where she would just we would take note of anything she said she didn't like and mm -hmm. we had a whole google image doc of all of the things claire hates and every time one would hear something they would go add an image to her like vision board of things claire hates <laughs> it was amazing and when she moved on from the organization it was like her going away card was this google doc oh my of, gosh the the anti-vision board yeah anti-vision board <laughs> they, they just make her skin crawl yeah that's great. Well, I also wanted to dig in a little bit to what Aaron was talking about, ways to effectively communicate. And, and the two main aspects she was describing is think about who your audience is and what the goal of your writing. It, it seems from what you've been saying that like you've got that, whether you're thinking about that like directly, you've got that down. Is that something that you help train let's say like new employees with or I mean because that may not be evident to everybody so specifically you know so we do project level work for clients so we do big website projects and so we do have guidelines on what information is topical timely and relevant for different mm -hmm. audiences right and meaning client versus project team versus agency operations, mm -hmm. which need a lot of the same information, but in different places and maybe at different frequencies, right? So so we do have some documentation around that that we like to encourage and train people on. And then, you know, we do have some best practices in terms of for clients, they need to have, a, going back to our conversation about like prompt replies, like they need to have a reply, even if it's just a, a receipt of acknowledging receipt, you know, by the end of the day and with some sort of understanding of when you'll get a solution back to them mm -hmm. and expectations internally that like you can turn off Slack or communication so you can go find flow, but you need to reply to people roughly by the end of the day or within, a, you know, so we try to set certain expectations there. What, mm -hmm. what I think we actually find is that people tend to communicate more than they need to. Mm -hmm. And in a way that they're like, I don't have time to go do work. It's like, we'll turn off these methods of communication for a minute. Mm -hmm. And you can come back and batch reply to these things, right? So I think that we actually find people are like so connected and and want to communicate so much more frequently than maybe they need to almost to their detriment, myself included, right? That makes perfect sense. Yeah, I have to like block out time in my calendar when I need to just like focus and, and write and, and get like my actual work done. And then, yeah, I just kind of schedule my day with like, all right, this this block is for me to do what I got to do. And then like, here's a half an hour where I'll respond to all the things. So yeah, that makes perfect sense to, yeah. to cause yeah, it's just easier, you know, like you can get busy and then like someone will be talking about their engagement or something on teams and, you know, and, and like, yeah, right. And, and, you know, that sparks a whole conversation, but it's like, I still got all the, you know, it's just like not the, yeah. so turning it off and responding later is, is great mm -hmm. advice. Yeah. Well, and so studies show that for every time you're distracted or breaking flow or context mm -hmm. switching, it's actually like a 20 minute loss. Mm -hmm. so just like know, resetting and, and trying to get back. Oh, okay. Back. 
flow. So like if you are in flow and you break flow to respond to something, whatever, your ability to get back into the state that you were in to make do productive work is like 20 minutes to 30 minutes long. So oh it makes gosh. you feel like it's fast, but it's like a pretty high loss of time. Yeah. So, you know, we've been doing some training on that and we are not there yet, but we are trying to get better at like, just turn the stuff off and come back later. And not, like, we're not saving anyone's lives. We're not mm. building, you know, like this is not, earth shattering work mm -hmm. will be fine if you are gone for two hours or three hours yeah. <laughs> or whatever right um, yeah so it's something that we're trying to get better at and that i'm trying to encourage people to do because it is a huge productivity loss for them and it also stresses everybody out yeah absolutely well in in that same vein are you the type of person that responds to emails after work hours no. or i turn no. it all off smart I don't have Slack or Teams on my phone for that reason yeah. too. I don't yeah, need exactly. it on my phone. I'll it's it's on the computer. I'll I will get to you, right? Like Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't respond to things after hours with the exception of like I I start early and end early. So, I end my day at 4 when my kids get home from school. Mm -hmm. So, while there are people on between 4 and 5:30, let's say, I will occasionally check in just in case there's anything end of day, but it's fairly low touch. And then after that I'm off. Like right. I don't all, all night. That's great. You got to spend time with your kids. Yeah. Yeah. Boundary setting has been a big thing mm -hmm. since going fully remote and really trying to set that like that's work because it's hard, you know, when you walk out of, in my case, the laundry room and then you're like into your other life. There's no commute home to decompress mm -hmm. and those things. Right. So you've got to create that boundary. Once I go out that door, I'm a different pat. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. In my office, it's one thing. <laughs> exactly. But then when you're like back and forth between worlds. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I really feel like in, oh my gosh, why am I going to blank on the movie? Avatar. You know, okay. they lay in the little pods and then they're like in a different world. <laughs> and I feel like that. I come in, I sit in this chair. I'm in my like three foot block on my mm -hmm. computer. You have a tail. Yeah. People. I have a tail. <laughs> and then I like unplug and go back into the 3D world. Oh man, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and those two people off. will never meet. Yeah. And those two people will never meet in real life, right? Like yeah. I have all of you coworkers I will never meet in real life. Probably. Yeah. It just feels like it's very metaphorical <laughs> yeah absolutely that's it's a very funny way of thinking of it well now i think it's a good time to go to the second clip with erin where she talks about uh how to balance being direct can we talk i know you've got a lot on your plate you've got work you've got friends you've got family pets you've got the people that you make small talk with at the coffee shop or gym you've got that bird that you see when you wake up every morning outside your window that you've projected things onto. Look at that bird. Doesn't even love its family. It's always by itself. You do that. Everyone does that. Point is, you've got a lot on your plate. Well, that's why there's Instacart to take a little bit off your plate. Using Instacart, you search for all your favorite foods and things that you need from the grocery store, all online, all while you're looking at that bird, wondering why it hasn't called its mom and they deliver it to you. They go to the store and do the shopping for you. And they can deliver it in as fast as an hour. And you can sign up by clicking the link in the description, wherever you're listening or watching. And that's a great way of supporting the show. So it's a great way of supporting this show. It's a great way to make your life a little bit easier because we all know that you have so much going on, like wondering whether that bird judges you back. Let's talk about being direct, right? So in, in, you know, I keep relating this back to my experience, but, and that's where a lot of the, the questions stem from, but I'm sure a lot of people have this as well. I get frustrated when people are beating around the bush a little too much. It's, it's just like, if you need something from me, tell me, how do you help somebody find, because it's got to be a balance of, of direct versus seeming harsh, like you said, how do you pe help people manage that scale? Yeah, good insight about balance. I think writing is largely about balance. For example, 
direct and clear, but also friendly and courteous, right? We have to kind of do both at once. I call it concise and nice <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> but yes, as we're working on being more direct, I'll, one thing to keep in mind, and then I'll get, I'll give a tip. But one thing to keep in mind is that directness preferences about that vary by culture. Mm. So keep in mind a little bit too, whether it's the culture, a culture, like a generational culture, different generations might have different preferences about how direct is good or impolite, et cetera, industries, and certainly regional cultures where some people might've grown up in a country where it's more rude to be direct. And mm -hmm. some might've grown up somewhere where we're asked to be direct. So we just have to kind of give each other some latitude, I think in that way, benefit of the doubt, because we're all coming from different cultural training in that regard. But Good what reminder, I like to encourage, yeah. What, yeah. yeah. what I like to encourage people to do if you're working to be more direct is focus on a sentence in your email or your DM or your post that is a call to action. I am someone who was guilty of sending an email and I wanted the reader to do something, but I don't know if I was quite beating around the bush, but I would catch myself sort of suggesting to the reader, like, here's, here's the latest document edits. I'm looking for feedback, <laughs> you know? I'm hoping that person will give me feedback, but it would have been nice if I said, here are the latest edits, please provide any comments by Thursday. I didn't really let them know, hey, I really would like you to do this, and I have a certain deadline that I need the ideas by. I was guilty of writing a call to suggestion, but really, when we feel nervous that we're being too direct, probably it's actually helpful for the reader. The reader does need to know what is expected of them in many emails. Like in many emails, we have a call to action, right? Like Patrick could say, hey, Aaron, I, I need your, your bio. Or I could say, hey, Patrick, I need the Zoom link, right? We need things from each other. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to be clear in that sentence. And the most important part of that sentence is your verb. Are you asking someone to review something, edit, submit, reply, make sure that that's in there early in that sentence so they know what to do because I agree it can get it can take too much time when we beat around the bush right absolutely yeah that that's a a very good I always want to know I don't I don't want to, an email to leave me guessing as to yeah. what the next step is so yeah that's that's exactly. that's really good to know a, a, a bad habit that people have is is no worries so over apologizing uh especially in a work setting where it's like you have to tell people what to do sometimes, right? Whether you're a leader or or you just need something from someone. What are your thoughts on using sorry and apologizing and, and kind of hedging in that regard? And, and how would you recommend people sort of alter that behavior? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that question because that's another thing we're dealing with both culturally and sort of like a time waster. <laughs> when we hedge. And on the cultural note, you know, I'll just throw in side note, people often study this and feel that women have been conditioned to do more of what you just said than men. Mm -hmm. And so we also want to kind of look out for the gendered aspects of our writing habits, because I think you're right. I've, I've really had to catch myself. I've caught myself saying sorry in emails and then I read it and I go, well, did I do something wrong? Yeah. I did it. <laughs> I'm going to take out the sorry because I didn't actually do anything wrong. But I think what we can do instead is go back to that rule, concise and nice. And what I like to say to people is that we can write a concise, direct sentence, but then go back and manage the verb to add some EQ. So for example, we could, if we had written something concise, like please attend Friday's meeting, then later we might think, attend that sounds kind of boring it just sounds like we're checking off the roll sheet i'm going to change it to please join us for friday's meeting and now it sounds more inclusive and like i care more about them so i was able to stay concise but also be nice by altering my verb which is usually where the tone is and so what i've tried to start doing is instead of hedging do things like that i'll write it out directly here's what's up i'm not saying sorry and then i'll go in and make sure that my verbs show the right tone that I haven't actually accidentally sounded blamey of either me or them mm -hmm. also comes back to kind of how how we use the word you and how we use the word I and who are we putting at fault in our sentences by arranging them in that way so 
I think to kind of reduce our hedging, I would say if you're worried like, hey, I have to hedge a little because I want to feel nice, but I also want to be direct. At the beginning of your email, just put an empathy statement or a bid for trust. Those are just words I use to remember things like, I hope you had a good weekend or thanks for your help on this project last week. Really, usually one sentence can set the tone of we're talking human to human and I'm not mad at you or anything. And then after that, I can go ahead and just be direct for the most part. Mm -hmm. But I always watch my verbs because verbs are where you can accidentally be condescending or be pushy. It's usually the verb that'll create that tone. Right. I, I think a lot of people have experienced this at work. The person who communicates too often, right, may send too many emails. I'm curious your thoughts on that, right? Because it could be tricky because someone, this person may be sending a lot of emails because they really need something. But it also kind of ties in with another question I had about, let's say, a, a work conflict. So maybe this person's oversharing or, or whatever it is. How do you manage in written communication uh, a time that something gets tense? Right, right, which is so common. Um, and like we were saying earlier, if our if our relationship exists only through writing, that means we need to deal with negative issues mm -hmm. with care, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're always writing for two goals, the information transfer and the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we always have to worry about that. So if I'm either asking someone to change their behavior, like please email less or, you know, shorten your emails. Or if I'm writing about conflict, one of the best strategies that helps me is to be careful with my use of you, because you know how the word you can sound like someone's pointing their finger at you. Mm -hmm. And so I'll use you all the time when it's positive. Like you gave me such good questions on the podcast or whatever, mm -hmm. right? But if I wanted to say something negative, if I was on a podcast where they didn't give that many questions or something, I'm not going to say you didn't give me good questions or something like that. I'm going to now talk about the product or the outcome, not the individual. And the product is the podcast. So the podcast questions, right? So if I were writing to someone and it was negative, I might say, I appreciate podcast questions that dig deeper or something like that. I'm mm -hmm. not going to say you messed up the questions. I'm going to focus on the questions. Mm -hmm. So whenever we can focus on the product, instead of your email confused me, I couldn't find the answer in the email. I try to switch from you and your when I'm writing about something negative. And when someone, when the specific issue is that someone's emailing too much, I also talk to them about, hey, you, you may need to work on getting your main point out there right away and having it be succinct. And then after that, you may be done with this email. I always advocate people write one sentence with the five W's, who, what, where, when, why, as a main point. You know, for example, the committee will meet next week to study this data for bias. I've said five W's really fast in one sentence. It's still concise. And if I put that at the beginning of my email, I might already be done or just need to explain a little more. But I find that the people who write too much on an email or too many emails, it's usually because we're afraid we didn't make our point clear enough. Mm -hmm. So by starting with your main point from the get-go, that often kind of settles down all that excessive emailing that we can get into when we're not sure if we were clear. Yeah, it's kind of like adding a, like a, a journalist, a newspaper writer kind of has a headline, right? And, and from yeah. there, everything connects to that. So that I had never thought of that like that. That's a, that's a great tip. I'm going to put that into work immediately. <laughs> Well, it's handy, but, and it's also good for, for writing nervousness because you know how we get what I call blank screen paralysis, mm -hmm. where you're looking at the blank screen of your email or document and you're like, oh my God, what, what's going to be my first word? And then we end up writing silly stuff like this is to inform you that, and it doesn't really inform those words don't inform mm -hmm. actually. And so what I encourage people to do is just write down who, what, when, where, why, write down what they are create a sentence out of that stuff. There you go. You've yeah, begun, great. right? So way less scary after that. Yeah. Also going back to what you were saying about separating the individual from the, the issue, I was trying to put myself in the shoes of, of this hypothetical person that you're messaging and, and just separating the you, I mean, wow. 
just mm-hmm. if, if if you had used you in that in that scenario about the podcast questions I would feel uh, I, I it would probably ruin my afternoon I'd be like oh I gotta do yeah. better you know and then like whereas it's just like it's not like a, it doesn't feel so personal and I, right. I would feel less I mean that's my own personal issue that I should waste the half afternoon beating myself up but it too. <laughs> yeah <laughs> But yeah, that's that's something else that I'm I'm learning here, and it makes so much sense. So I I feel like I'm a broken record, just be like, oh man, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool if it's useful. I mean, that one kind of came up when I was teaching college all those years, and students would turn in their papers, and you know, I'm writing comments on the side or using track changes or whatever. And I would, if it was positive, I started putting a bubble comment that said like you supported your point so well on this page mm-hmm. on page two, two you provided awesome evidence on page two but then I started developing this idea well what if they didn't I'm not going to say you failed to provide evidence on page two I'm just going to say page two needs more evidence yeah because page two is the issue it's not you or me it's neither of us it's the product that we're trying to create together I was so interested in in talking to uh, Aaron about like being direct because I, I mean, and she set me straight a little bit with reminding the cultural differences, right? I'm from New York. And so I, I appreciate and I, I want people to be very direct with me, but I know that that's not the case. And I do see the differences in, in the different teams around the country. I'm wondering how you sort of balance being direct. Oh, this is so resonating because okay. so about five years ago, we went through a merger with this okay. Canadian company. So we mm-hmm. had the U.S. team and the Canadian team, and we were forming this one hour team. Mm-hmm. Canadians are known for being very nice. Yes. Southerners in the U.S. are known for being very nice. Mm-hmm. But I think as we all know culturally, whether it's in Canada or the Midwest or the South, very nice also means talk shit behind your back. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, when we were going through sort of our storming, forming, norming with our Canadian team, they felt like we were just so direct and so forceful and like very quote unquote American, Mm. which I was like, oh my gosh, like, I feel like we are so respect, like you, you should meet people from New York. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We're bad, you know, whatever. Um, It gets worse. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It could be way worse, you guys. And so over the last four or five years, I've learned a lot about cultural differences between the U.S. and Canada and the and Midwest and everywhere, right? And like these nuances in communication. And I think that that's where some of that adding color to your mm. Slack stuff also helps, right? But sometimes being too direct, if there is a too direct, is, is challenging. That being said, the whole clear is kind from Brene Brown and how you communicate directly without direct meaning forcefully, mm-hmm. right? Being really clear in your communication is something I'm, I think we're all still working on, but that we've gotten a lot better at, right? It's like, it's not about being like, I have no filter directness, but I have feedback. I'm yeah. Like, that feedback now. Here is the feedback, right? And, and I'm not being that, mean. It, not this, mean. This is just the reality of, of the world we live in. There's feedback. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. there's feedback and there's feedback in the workplace. And I think it gets extra challenging in remote, right? Because you don't mm-hmm. have the trust building and the communication. So then when you have to give somebody feedback and you don't have that rapport, you have mm-hmm. to be extra aware of how you are clearly and directly communicating. Absolutely. Yeah. And in, in times that when I was back in New York and working in offices, you could go for a walk with somebody you can go get coffee with someone and like right. iron things out. Right. If, if you can sense, you know, you can sense from body language and stuff that something has bothered someone and that's sort of eliminated in, in just sort of the world we're in. And, and so, yeah, you have to be, it, it's just good to understand these cultural differences and, and going both ways, right. That like when I'm being direct and to the point, I, I don't mean anything by it. It's just, to me, I'm like trying to save the other person's time by just that's what that's all you need to know. I'll buy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. The the other thing I've learned around this in the last year is we did these disc assessments that mm-hmm. are like personality profiles, essentially, and like how you learn and absorb information and, and how you navigate through things. And so it's like D, I, S, and C's, and D's are like very direct, and mm-hmm. I's like to have influence, S's like stability, and C's, of course, I'm going to blank on C, what the, the C stands for, but they re- they need a lot of information. Right. Mm. So I have learned about myself that I like directness. I like executive summaries. I like here is the minimum, like the TLDR. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't like that. A lot of Mm -hmm. people want all of the information so that they can make that assessment for themselves and that that you haven't like summarized it for them. So that's been a, a like a personal growth over the last year or so is recognizing what things I feel like are direct and clear, but other people are like, that's not enough information. Mm. But that's, I mean, even that is such an effective level of communication where it's like, they're telling you like, I, I would like some more. So, and now, you know, right. It's just, right. we can't guess what's in each other's heads, right. you know, which is uh, like, even that level of communication is almost unthinkable for myself personally, like 10 years ago, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's great. It's, it's good to just yeah. not leave people guessing, right. To yeah. fill in the yeah, voice. Like the self-awareness of what things work for you and how they don't work for others, I think is part of that, like cultural awareness of directness or what information you're able to give. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then also we came back to planning your commitment. Uh, planning your communication with who you're speaking to, what your audience is. And going back to what you were just saying, like someone saying that I need a little bit more context. I mean, I I just love that. Yeah. I I love that people are advocating for themselves in that regard because uh, that just makes the whole organization flow better. Yeah. And that's been through training for sure. Like we've been going through some process overhaul over the last year or so and one of the activities we learned how to do were these things called context sessions, which is where, you know, the team is required to ask questions to receive the information instead of whoever has the information just mm. dropping it on them. Because <laughs> when someone is just like giving you, here's all of the things you probably need to know, they mm. absorb like 10% of that. The rest of it just washes away and is loss. But mm. if it's more of a pull system where like you're asking me questions today, you're more likely to res- to remember the things I'm saying because you, you've you asked to receive that information, mm-hmm. right? So it's more of a pull system. So it's been a work in progress, but I do think that people are getting better at advocating for like, I need more context. I need more information as part of that, like training and building it into our project plans and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I mean, and that just makes me think of how we all learn differently. So like you may be downloading the information, you know, here's the three things that you need to know about this project, but it's like, in order to really understand it, I need to understand like the the context that surrounds those three things right. and people approach that differently. So yeah, that is, yeah. that is, I haven't even thought of that. That's, that's a great thing to, to start to actively ask questions. Well, so it's, yeah, it's questions asking. And then there's also like, there's three different ways that people predominantly remember information. It's like one is auditory, listening to to something someone's saying. The other one is visual. So like reading it for yourself. And the third Mm -hmm. is kinesthetic, like touching Mm -hmm. things, right? So if you're in a physical office, you might put stuff up on a board on sticky notes. And so that helps people retain that information. In the digital world, we try to use tools like Miro to put, sticky notes on a virtual whiteboard and and the team members being able to create the sticky note and type it themselves and whatever are more likely to retain that information because they have touched it, read it, felt it, put it on the board. They have like a image of where things are in the board in their head mm-hmm. that helps their, the photographic memory style stuff, right? So it's been inter- it's interesting, like the communication plus being authentic to different people learning different ways and trying to create space for all of that is has been a big journey for me over the last couple of years. And it leads to a lot of like empathy for your team and all of these places that they are, that they both the cultural histories that they come from and their geographic location, and then the ways that they like mentally function. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that that's not the same for everybody. 
empathy. Who would have known, right? Who would have known? (laughs) Like communication is all about empathy. Considering other people, yeah. Yeah, yeah. For humans, just caring about other humans. Yeah. (laughs) Well, cool. I think it's it's a good time to go to the third and final clip with Aaron, where we talk a little bit about what it means to be a good writer and how companies can work with someone like her. One of life's mysteries is that birthdays always find me unprepared, catch me unprepared. I don't go on Facebook as much, so I, I don't notice them as much. But I want I want to express my love and, and appreciation for friends and family. That wasn't part of the copy, I'm just saying it. <laughs> year after year, month after month, even when I see it coming, I'm not ready. Am I a jerk? Yes and no. <laughs> Why do things have to be so black and white for you? But I've got great news, friends. Introducing monthly card subscriptions from the Cardist Studio. Join the service that delivers the card and the stamp that you'll need to your door. No more errands. Uh, Who wants more errands? I don't know why, but I'm starting to think of errands as a kid's name. Errands, go back to bed. (laughs) Okay, but here's how it works. You choose your categories, from birthdays and celebrations to love and encouragement, or select their full collections and have those thank you notes and just because cards at the ready. Those ones are always so nice. Like when you get a card for doing something and it's just like a small little heads up or or token of appreciation, it, it genuinely makes you feel really good. And best of all, you would never get caught cardless again. Let me repeat, you'll never get caught cardless again. Try to say that a bunch of times in a row. You'll never get caught cardless again. Monthly card subscriptions from as little as $8 per month for the card and the stamp. Delivered to you. Thecardistudio.com shop subscriptions. And you can use the promo code ANXIETYPOD for 15% off your originating order. So a lot of my questions have been related to different instances, uh, but I want to turn it over to you. And, and what do you think makes a, a good writer, a, a good communicator at, at work? Yeah, well, a good communicator is something that we can all be. We don't, writing is not, or communicating, those are not skills that we have to be born amazing at. Those are skills that we build up over time. Mm -hmm. And to me, a really good writer is somebody who thinks about their reader. It's somebody who thinks about the situation their reader's in and uses some empathy. Like, hey, is this person super busy right now? Okay, I'm just going to email them the bottom line. I'll explain it another day. Or thinking about the values of our readers. Like, this person loves teamwork, so I'm going to point out to them what other team members were involved. Speaking to what's relevant to our readers. And then also adjusting our writing depending on our goal, where it's kind of like, oh, I want to tell this person my opinion and possibly become friends. That goal is going to guide the way I choose my words. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I want to disagree with them, but I don't want our relationship to get ruined. So I'm going to manage the way I use the word you. And so I think what makes a good writer is not as much the writing itself, but the thinking that happens behind the writing. That's why I say and 100% mean that we can all be good at it. It's not something that we need a muse or an inborn a talent. It's an analytic situation and we're all logical. So we can stop and think who's going to read this and what am I trying to do? And that those thoughts will help us decide like the order of our ideas in the, in the writing, depending on what's relevant to the reader. It'll help us decide on the tone, word choice, all of that. So we can feel autonomous and independent in making those choices when we step back and say, who's this for and what's my goal? And I think that makes a good, a good writer, someone who thinks about the person on the other side and clarifies their message according to what will work for that reader. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it just informs, it's, it's, a, it's a guiding light, like sort of a North Star, I guess, of, yes. of you know, if you lose your way, you, okay, come back to that, come back to that. And, and uh, what, uh, yeah, what are you trying to do? And, and who is the audience? Yeah, that's great advice. We spoke about 
kind of like the first moments of, of what it's like to work with you. But overall, what do, do you call them workshops or, or courses or, or uh, I'll, I'll let you explain that. And, and, and what do they, what do they look like and how can they be different? Yeah, well, the workshops are lots of fun. I use kind of the words interchangeably. Usually I'll say workshop or class for something live that we're doing together, which mm-hmm. is usually like a live Zoom where we're all, you know, discussing together, although mm-hmm. it could be in person, but usually isn't, of course, these days. And then what I have some self-paced ones on my website that I just refer to as courses that an individual could take alone. But so in any of those, what it looks like is usually I'll kind of, we'll talk about some pain points, like, oh, it's so hard to be concise. Here's why. And then we'll look at some strategies here, try these two things to be concise, and then people will try them out. And we just fill up the chat box with all kinds of sentences from all kinds of participants and analyze like, oh, what a cool choice this person made when they put that word in, or, ooh, look at how this person managed the word you. So it's kind of like discussing real struggles and strategies to address them. And then a lot of practicing and getting into groups and trying something out or trying it out on your own. And then sharing, like I said, true confessions of fails too. You know, it, people will bring up, oh yeah, I did this weird thing in an email last week and we brainstorm, okay, what, what can we do instead? So we would feel confident about that email. And so I, th- I hope that people come away with strategies that are very practical and immediate that they could use that afternoon, but at the same time that they've had the chance to practice, not just learn in an abstract way. Well, you've already given me things that I'm going to use this afternoon. So (laughs) I definitely, I I, I see the value in working with someone such as yourself immensely. It's just, it's just a good check-in every once in a while to, to have something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Outside of working with someone such as yourself, what would you recommend someone do to help improve their writing? Is it reading other authors, different types of media? What would you say, like, someone just wants, like, a little bit of homework? Yeah, yeah. A great a great way to study the best writing practices for workplace and real-life writing is to read, I would suggest, a couple of specific magazines, which are National Geographic and Discover. Mm -hmm. Um, So the reason I suggest those often is let's think about what topics they cover in National Geo. We're talking physics, anthropology, chemistry, oceanography, super difficult stuff in every single article. And yet they're never hard to read and they're never hard to learn from. They, the writers use, use strategies to help your brain kind of follow along. They'll structure sentences in a way that follow very progressively on one another, that build on one another. And we're able to learn about these concepts with no background. And, and it's clear, it's concise. They know that they need to hold people's interest and not over explain. So those I find to be the best models. It, you're absolutely right. Any kind of reading helps us develop our own communication um, fluency. But I think often we think, okay, cool, I'll read a novel, which is great. But when we're looking at business writing, those magazines really get to the point quickly and are good top good ideas to look at, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that is so true. I think about someone taking a complex subject that we may have zero, right? It's, it's different to understand about like a local news project, you know, infrastructure or fixing a road, like connecting to an article like that. But when someone's like, writing an article about a discovery on Jupiter or something with physics. It's like, I have no idea what you mean, right? And and yet you do right. feel like you're along with the, the reader. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. And they, they use word choice that will work for us and we can learn from that model because they choose words that are familiar to us so that we don't get intimidated, you know, mm-hmm. as we're reading. And I think a, another aspect of writing well is to not alienate our readers as can happen when when people use kind of show off vocabulary that could intimidate or alienate someone. So it's better to use simple, familiar, direct words when we can. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I just want to make sure, is there anything you think I'm, I'm missing? Anything, tips that you want to share or, or anything like that that you think uh, is important to note? Sure. Yeah, I'll leave us with, with this tip. That, as I mentioned, it's who's reading this and what's my goal that should guide our writing. But what I feel also, well, two things I'll say about building writing confidence. Number one, practice kind of standing in that power of expertise, because anytime you're writing, you know more about your goal than anybody else. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So you're actually better equipped to answer your writing questions and make your writing decisions than a teacher or a book would be because you have the expertise on the situation. You understand what you're trying to do for that reader. And since writing is situational, you're actually the person who knows the most. You, any person knows more about that situation than I do when they're writing. So if we can kind of develop the habit of having that be powerful, stopping and thinking, oh yeah, I actually do have expertise right now, expertise in the situation, and getting into that habit can help us develop or empower ourselves in our writing. And then I'd also add confidence building. You know, I don't know if folks have read that book, The Confidence Code, that talks about how to be confident in life. Well, their finding was that the best way to build confidence is to take risks. Mm -hmm. So I encourage people to take safe risks in their writing. For example, if you have a trusted colleague or you've told your supervisor, hey, I'm working on some cool new writing stuff take risks and try, oh, I'm going to try a main point sentence with the five W's today. Ooh, I'm going to try a call to action. I'm going to try to stop using passive voice. And by taking risks and also by making mistakes, that's the best way to build confidence. So we want to kind of, anytime we have to write, stop and sort of stand in the power of I'm the one who knows this situation. I'm going to figure out what to do on my own, but then also be willing to take a risk when it's safe to do so. Because little by little, we'll collect the mistakes and the successes, and then we'll build not only writing strategies, but writing confidence. Awesome. Yeah. Well, where can people get a hold of you uh, on your website and, and your social media in case they want to work with you? Yeah, yeah. I'd love to talk to folks about writing struggles and getting confident and clear. I'm on LinkedIn as Erin Labax, of course. My YouTube channel is High Value Writing. My website is highvaluewriting.com. If folks would like to check out the YouTube channel, you know, there's a bunch of free content on writing EQ and also writing IQ, just how to do the right things, how to be clear, how to write a main point, how to write an email. And Instagram is also high value writing. So happy to connect with you all in whatever way works for you. And I also take requests on video topics. So you can hop on YouTube and put something in the comments about what you want to learn. And I'll create a video in response in the coming weeks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all you do. And thank you so much for your time. I, I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me, Patrick. So it sounds like you've worked with people like Aaron that that come in and, and help your organization. What was that like? It's, it seems like you've got a lot of good information from, from bringing in a specialist. I fully am aware of where my shortcomings are and that we need other people to help. <laughs> <laughs> That's why other people do their job. So Put that, that we, on on like your LinkedIn like headline. Yeah. <laughs> I, seriously, it's like, you know, it, it would be on my resume is like knows where my my skills start and end and brings yeah. it us to help. <laughs> yeah. So we we've done it in a range of places, whether that's leadership coaching or whether that process changes. And then also on, you know, like the HR side and all, and like the, the cultural norm side and, and these sorts of things, like as a marketing agency, you know, we tend to have cobbler's kids. Our, our stuff isn't as good as maybe the stuff we produce for others, for ourselves. Right. And so we also bring in folks to help us with our own website and stuff, because it's always the thing that gets backburnered. And I've learned so much from the consultants and things that we've brought in, and they've really changed the way that we do work and the way that I think about all these things. Like most of the stuff that we've talked about and I've shared with you today, it's like I can draw a direct line back to which teacher has come in to, to help us with that specific thing and that, that growth and learning. So I think it's very valuable for in an organization to recognize where your skills are and where they fall short. And in leadership, you tend to not get a lot of professional development opportunities because your growth is different than mm -hmm. when you are in other places in the organization, if you're an individual contributor or manager or whatnot. So the, I find all of that to be like my own personal professional development and growth is bringing in those people to help us as an organization. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. I mean, the times that I've worked at places and they've brought some someone in, like I can only remember like one time where it didn't do anything, right? It really is helpful. And just like get, you know, at work, we, we tend to like, put the headlights or the blinders on rather uh, yeah. getting my metaphors mixed up and and just yeah. continuing down the path and it's just good to have those removed even for a couple hours by a specialist 
Yeah, absolutely. Like the working on the business instead of in the business for mm -hmm. that period of time. And recently we brought in a, a guy who's just amazing in, in the field for, for design. And he came in and we do shop talks or lunch and learns, but we call them shop talks. And the team just was like, this was a highlight of the year, you know, of the last oh, wow. month. This is so lovely to have a, a an industry expert come in to teach and not just be so like navel gazing on the stuff that we're doing and whatever, right? And like really mm -hmm. get people inspired. So we're um, I'm working on a program right now for the rest of the year to bring in more industry experts in a range of ways to to get the team sort of out of their head and learn and have us growing and thinking so that maybe we're not just so focused on how what we do and exactly how we do it but like being mm. more open to other opportunities and being able to use the same language like i find that we struggle with semantics a lot where it's mm -hmm. like someone's calling three people are calling the same thing or different things the same word right and it's like well i thought that this was a roadmap and it's like well no this slight variation is a roadmap no no it's this so when we can bring in experts who then share information to the whole team, and then we all use that language because we've all aligned on what they're saying, right? Mm. That's that's really helpful and and brings people together from a that's language great. communication standpoint. Just cutting out the the fluff, so to speak. Yeah, just yeah, because those conversations, right? Those those are like I always hated. I, I went to school in Buffalo. I'm from Long Island, and. So often, like my freshman year, I remember people arguing whether soda is pop or soda. And it's yeah. like, this is why I can't, I can't be around this conversation. It's too aggravating. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> we matter. No, right? it's both. What we're talking about. Yeah. Right. It's both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then in the South, it's like, or is it Coke? Yeah. Right. Uh, I've heard that too. Yeah. Which is even yeah. more crazy, but I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not, you're not going to get me. Don't go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the other, the, the homework aspect of what Aaron was talking about is very interesting to me. And, and I did this interview a while back and I, I've started reading a little bit more national and geographic. One of the places that she recommended hmm. the advice is, is so Good. I mean, be, as you know, for the listeners, just to remind, she talks about how National Geographic has to be able to explain everything from, you know, a bacteria that's being studied or black holes or like insert every complex scientific thing you can think about. And yet the average person could read National Geographic. It's not like a, a, a textbook at Harvard, right? It's just, right. and, and I, I've been trying to figure out like how they do it, but it's just, I, it, it's impressive. I, I don't really think I have any like specific goals or, or things to mention, but it's just sort of simplifying, I think, is, yeah. is the main, like getting to the core of the idea that needs to be communicated. Right. Which is that plain language and that directness, right? Is like, how do you take complex ideas and make them accessible to every person. We do a lot of work with accessibility in our website design and development. And that's everything from, you know, color contrast and visual accessibility and physical accessibility, but also understanding the content in a mm -hmm. way that is accessible. And like on the internet, there are all these readers and things that will scan content and tell you what grade level the reading is mm. of that content. And, you know, generally you want the, the reading level to be like seventh or eighth grade. Like you want it to be pretty low so that it can be accessible to most of the people on the internet. Right. right. So I think that if, you know, National Geographic is a great example of taking complex ideas and simplifying them to, for greater absorption and accessibility. Absolutely. And, and one of the other things I, I, I've taken from reading them a little bit closer is, not only knowing what to say, but knowing what not to say, right? Like trimming the fat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and that's a, that's a huge thing for, I mean, interpersonal communication to copywriting to on and on and on, just knowing where the line is, where things are not. I, you know, and I tend to, to get excited about the things I'm working on and just put some butter on. <laughs> that's something yeah. I'm, I'm working on, trying to trim that back a little bit. Yeah, we, I'm a person who really likes the TLDR. I, I like the like concise bullet points. And so I am fully aware that I like scan blocks of things, right? To like, what is exactly the thing that I want? 
And I have a, a few people who are very like verbose is the way that they would describe themselves and in mm-hmm. both their written and, and verbal communication. And there's a period where I just am washed over with information where I'm like, I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. So there's mm-hmm. lots of great quotes out there about like a lot of communication is about what you don't say. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that that's totally true, especially in like the modern workplace where there's so much information happening mm-hmm. and people are paying attention to Twitter or like all of these things, right? So it's like there's yeah. a lot of information. So just start listing all the things they could be paying attention to. I mean, to. Yeah. you know, like you've got Slack and email and Twitter and like all whatever. Yeah. Right? It's crazy. And so the more we can be direct and clear in the communication and, and cut out a lot of that extra, I feel like it's easier for people to absorb the information. Not Absolutely. always, but yeah. <laughs> in theory. Yeah. Theory. It's a great theory. Yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm just wondering if there's anything else that you wanted to add about work communication and if there's any social media or or anything you'd like to tell the people about. Oh, wow. Let's see. I don't know if there's anything else on work communication. I think to to be the person that touts sort of like the improv at work, there's this great book called Humor Seriously. Mm which is just so good, but it's about the value of levity at work and the value of those moments that make people uh, drop their guard so that they can communicate and partner with you effectively. So that's not mine, but I, I would highly encourage anyone who's sort of thinking about this sort of communication and and sort of improv habits, if you will, at work to to read that book, because it's really wonderful. And then as far as socials, like I'm speaking of boundaries, I'm trying really hard to like lock down the socials and not uh, participate too much. So I mean, I'm on LinkedIn, and uh, really happy to have been here. And and this was really fun. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And always, you know, it's a a bit of a crapshoot. But if you come down to Theater 99, you'll definitely have fun. But you could see Stacey and you could see me. You got it. You never know who you're going to Never know who is going to be because we don't know until Until the day before, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Well, thank you. And and yeah, this has been great. Well, all right. I I hope you learned some different things that can help you in your work communication. Definitely some food for thought. Definitely some things I've implemented. implemented implemented since having these discussions with Aaron and and Stacy. So yeah, sometimes it's good to not only to like take a step outside of your day-to-day work and like think about work. I don't know, that's, that makes it sound so grandiose. Think about work itself. And now you can get like the the details done better. And people who do that, I mean, it's it's a little bit of an obvious statement, but <laughs> People who do those sorts of things are the people who are successful. I mean, if you're thinking of someone who's successful right now, I'm sure you're thinking of like how they analyze their processes and and how they go about things, the why they do certain things. It's all important to do. So yeah, thank you so much to Stacey and thank you to Aaron. Okay, before I get to the weird thing causing me anxiety this week, I want to remind you of the Buy Me a Coffee link. It's just a way to make a donation to the show. Uh, The link is in the description. My partnership with Pure Spectrum CBD, they're offering the promo code ANXIETYPOD for 15% off. There's a link in the description for that. There's also a link for Instacart if you want to sign up for home delivery groceries. Yeah, that's grammatically that sentence was perfect. It was a perfect sentence, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to clean that up. (laughs) But if you sign up for, or if you sign up through the link, for the link, gosh, I'm falling apart here. Speaking of falling apart, how thrilled were conspiracy theorists this week to have a Chinese spy balloon? It was like Christmas morning, right? (laughs) Like any crazy plot that you want to project onto the spy balloon. I, I, you know, people did. Anyway, coming back to reality. By signing up for Instacart through the link in the description, uh, you're telling Instacart that this show sent you, which helps support the show. And then there's the Cardist Studio who offer the promo code ANXIETYPOD for 15% off your initial order. So yeah, check out all the sponsors and thank you to them for supporting the show. Okay, yeah, so the weird thing causing me anxiety this week is whenever Jamie is gone, I load myself up with so many different things that I want to get done around the house. 
uh, different things that I need a little bit of extra time to work on the podcast or uh, my day job and, and uh, you know, just stuff that you need more time because I, I do try to balance, you know, work and life and, and make sure I'm being present and uh, being available to Jamie when, when, you know, work is done. But once in a while, you do need to work on some larger projects. And, and so I just I put so much on myself there in this week that I, like I just get so stressed out. And so I'm hoping I don't do that. I'm, I'm trying to just breathe and relax and stop putting too much on my shoulders and making myself all crazy. But that seems to be just who I am. <laughs> Maybe I'll change. Maybe. Here's to hoping. Well, as always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you on Thursday. 